Welcome to the very first episode of this podcast, the recording of the minutes and notes of the Anarcho-Syndicalist Film Club. We are a group of usually four, sometimes three friends who meet virtually to discuss a film selected by a rotating executive. This group came out of my mind as I was watching the peasant scene of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, and for those of you who haven't seen it recently or at all, the 1970s com com comedy classic, structure of this collective is explained when a 37-year-old peasant named Dennis, decidedly not an old woman, chides King Arthur about his monarchical system of government and tries to give a crash course on their regional constitution. Quote, we're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. We're taking turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week, but all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting by a simple majority in the case of purely internal affairs, but by a two thirds majority in the case of more major ones." Unquote. And Arthur subsequently suppresses Dennis with state violence before we get to learn any more about this autonomous collective's government. Nevertheless, the seed was planted and out sprouted the idea for this group of film lovers, admirers, or watchers. <laughs> Uh, because executive officer for the week is quite the mouthful, we call ourselves the PIP, rhymes with chip, which is short for Primus, <laughs> Primus, <laughs> uh, I'm going to cut this part. <laughs> PIP rhymes with chip, you already said PIP, we know it rhymes with chip. <laughs> Is that scripted? It was, it was being you written write? down, it was being written down, I didn't, I didn't think about it. All right. Uh, which is short for, uh, because executive officer for the week is quite the mouthful, we call ourselves the PIP, which is short for Primus Inter Paris. We rotate the executive responsibilities, which include selecting the week's film and leading discussion of said film among ourselves, all while maintaining the legislative responsibilities for authorizing or vetoing film selections. If none of this makes sense, hopefully it will after a few meetings. For you, the audience, this is the first meeting and the first episode, but we've been doing this for the past uh, 17 weeks, working out the kinks, patching up leaks, and mending broken bones. We've since discussed popular films such as The Truman Show and I, Tanya, and more niche films such as The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie and Chicken Girls, the movie. <laughs> Hopefully, there'll be even more up and down the cinematic spectrum. I am one of your hosts, Christian Choi. I studied at the University of California, Los Angeles. Some call it UCLA, where I received my degree in history. Currently, I am a graduate student at the University of Georgia, where I still study history. Some might say poorly, some adequately, never well. <laughs> With a concentration on American business and imperial history, a quick warning to the listener, I tend to push discussions towards the esoteric, philosophical, and abstract, but our other hosts are here to rein me in from a self-destructive spiral. Now for some more interesting folks, starting with Sheldon Toe. Hello, everybody. Um, yay. <laughs> <laughs> The next up, uh, Zara. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> now then, introduce yourself. This intro is way too long. <laughs> okay, I don't know what to say. Say whatever you want. Sheldon, I was born on Mars, and I went to college <laughs> on Venus. Um, now I'm here on the planet Jupiter, where I'm dialing in via modem um, <laughs> to this Zoom meeting where we are discussing uh, films, uh, I, I, I presume. <laughs> Next up, let's introduce uh, my friend Ying Lisier. Oh God. Well, hello. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person on this call that hasn't gone to UCLA, which is a delight. So that'll be the only add-on I'm bringing in. Um, so I'm a UX designer and researcher by trade. So I'll usually have more things to say about the aesthetics and I'm an absolute movie novice. So uh, expect nothing of uh, my opinions. Uh, just just flame me alive in the comments, y'all. 
All right, and passing it to Zara. Christian made me feel bad, so I wrote something. Um, hey everyone, I'm Zara. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'm not a film expert, but I am a loud clap expert. <laughs> Let me see if I can give an example. <laughs> I don't know if that is actually translated. You blew out the microphone. <laughs> yeah, your, your power was so immense that the first one knocked out the microphone. Yeah. Well, that's us. All right. So generally, our discussions follow a simple structure. First, we give our binary opinions of the week's films, positive or negative. No confusing in-betweens or degrees of positivity or negativity. Then, a discussion of the filmic elements, what worked, what didn't work. And this part of the film, or this part of the discussion, is most shaped by the PIP. Based on our individual opinions, pre-discussion and post-discussion, we'll reach some sort of synthesis by scoring the film on a scale of 1 to 10 with discrete quarter intervals, then averaging the scores for an overall club score. Finally, we'll close out the session by deciding that next week's film and addressing miscellaneous administrative issues, quote, by a simple majority in the case of purely internal affairs, but by a two thirds majority in the case of more major ones. Our first, uh, our first film for, the, for this club is uh, A Beautiful Mind 2001, directed by Ron Howard, starring Russell Crowe and Jennifer Connelly. So uh, what were your opinions of the film? My thumb is down for this movie. Oh. Hey, I'm trying to... Just give it. A, yeah. Like, wow. Yeah. If we're recording auditorily. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I did a thumbs up for Zara. It was a thumbs up. I'll also give it a thumbs up. I'm also giving it a thumbs up. Uh, but <clears throat> I should note that uh, watching it this time around, I did not enjoy it as, as much as I had previously. So, yeah. Um, so let's 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 talk about stuff. Um, so, well, Sheldon, what did you not like about the film? Then I think Cheers was the yeah. Um, it's I, I have seen this in the past, um, and seeing it the second time, um, definitely, I think I've uh, matured as a human person, and um, it, it just didn't feel um, like it, it was a cohesive. It, it just, it felt like, um, I'm, I'm trying to describe it. Um, it just wasn't that interesting. Okay. And uh, I felt like it, it could have been more focused, but at the same time, um, no, no, I think that's it. it. It just kind of lacked focus. It was a bit all over the place. Um, I mean, historically, uh, it did gloss over a lot of John Nash's life. Um, and to call this a biography would, um, I think, be uh, I think be a poor label to use. Um, like you can make a, a film about a, a real person and show a segment of their life, um, you know, uh, relatively accurately. This attempted to show a period of uh, sixty some years, uh, from the forties to the nineties, so fifty some years. Um, and it just, yeah, so to cover a time span of that, uh, of that scale um, and leave out the details uh, that, you know, might add some controversy to the character, I think are a disservice to the, to the viewer. Um, and yeah, it, it's just hagiography of John Nash. It doesn't have much nuance of his, of his character. I think that's a I think that's a good characterization. Uh, characterization. Um, I, my problems with this were similar, um, and my point of reference is a uh, forty two, which is the Jackie Robinson biopic, and I had very similar uh, criticisms of that film as I did for this film, in that it doesn't you know do a very good job of showing everything that say, and, and I'm comparing it to maybe like. A film like Gandhi, which is, you know, a lot longer, but does a better job of like going through a lot of what he went through, as opposed to seemingly disjointed chunks of, of his life. Yeah. I think 
if I may jump in, um, I think what 42 does well is that it does focus on that particular part of Jackie Robinson's life. Um, it, it's the point where, um, you know, he's going from the Negro leagues into major league baseball and breaking that color barrier. That's the point of that movie. It doesn't, um, mm -hmm. there was no effort given into showing Jackie Robinson's later commitment to civil rights and, um, his uh, outspokenness and his, the controversies that he that rose in the field after he had broke the color barrier, but it, it shows that particular moment of his life and that um, yeah it, it it very neatly wraps up that time of his life while this movie um, tries to do it all um, yeah and I, I didn't like how it went. I feel like this movie um, did try to have some cohesiveness like through the love of um his wife alicia he was able <laughs> to get through his um his like barriers uh, the the only reason why i think that is because at the very end in his speech it, it highlights that i feel like that's what they tried to do but failed did it did so poorly because there's a lot of like, like scenes with that that shows their relationship, but it was just just like all over the place. So it makes sense. Yeah, I would say like when this movie came out, I remember the reviews being very much like it's a beautiful ode to his wife. Um, their love story is so immense and all of this, but it cuts a lot of corners of John Nash's life. So it kind of like like something that rubbed me the wrong way the first time that I watched this movie and this time is that it is very much a romanticization of John Nash and mm -hmm. even Alicia, like yeah. they didn't pick an actress who looks like Alicia. They didn't pick an actress who's from the same background as Alicia. They choose to skim her over as simply an add on to John's John Nash's life. That's something that I really dislike. I think there are a lot of other problems. Like there are other biopics of say like, or I wouldn't call this a biopic, but, um, like historical movies about who is it Stephen Hawking and that kind of stuff and people have been like oh they cut out these parts of this person's life in this part in this movie they straight up like wrote Alicia as not who she is um I think it's not the the most truthful part are the quotes that they use from the original book and the fact that this is based on a biography mm -hmm. at least allows for some translation of like okay maybe this is re a real representation of their relationship and the Nash's own review of the movie in which they liked it and um were positive about it but also they're very like i would say relatively conservative people with nash being from west virginia and like his own storied past he probably was happy to just say like yeah it's good and um i don't know i it just furthers the the idea that alicia was um instrumental in just helping him through they they like touch on some issues of her relationship with him too about her feeling frustrated but they never even address the fact that they like got divorced and he lived with her as like just a part of his life. Instead, she's just kind of picking up the pieces for him and not even heavily featured. It's uh, that part will still rub me the wrong way. Yeah. Do you know who um like how much like how involved they were in uh, getting this film up and running and like how much of a, an approval they gave? Was was it like really positive and everything? Well, it wasn't entirely based. So I would hesitate to say it was based on Nash's life story and more inspired by it. In 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 terms of like the way <laughs> the life structure goes on and like certain developments are framed, um, but everything else between those things gets muddled and gets. Um, affected artistically by the production staff, right? Uh. Yeah, like there's an artistry to what they chose to represent. Mm -hmm. And it might be like, hey, you know, the staff doesn't have the original biography. They're not gonna take a week off and be like, I'm gonna read the whole thing. They just have the script and they're gonna move forward and make it as artistically beautiful as possible. They represent the moments well, but that doesn't speak to the moments themselves in reality. I don't even know if it was made well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was made well enough to well. 
conjure up the <laughs> yeah. best picture, Dude, which is I just felt a new wait, wait, what? Solid. It won best picture? Yeah. Yeah. It won, it won like a, a ton slate of awards. Of awards, yeah. At the Oscars. Okay. 2001 must have been. Okay, and then uh, now I'm like, mm. hey, beat Fellowship of the Rings, which is difficult to do because that is the best film in that trilogy, um, which is unusual. <laughs> I, That's kind I of would... upsetting. That's like them saying, we hate the nerds. Uh, give it to this <laughs> other nerd, this more handsome nerd played by we, Russell Crowe. <laughs> we want this romanticized nerd instead. We don't want the real real nerds. I, yeah, I, I felt that it just, it was just so melodramatic. Um, uh, the, I don't know if we're gonna get into it now, but I just felt the score just was so uh, over the top. It was intrusive, emotionally manipulative to like a degree where I just, uh, like, yeah. it was just, yeah, it was just um, a visceral reaction that I had. I was like, what? Stop with the music. <laughs> yeah. Stop it. James Horner, I love your scores. interesting that you feel that way. But <laughs> shut up. <so> much. <laughs> I gave it a 55, which is the lowest I've given in a, well, not in a while. Really? We did watch <laughs> Children of the Corn recently. <laughs> but uh, but in, before that, <laughs> in a while. It, it's did Chicken Girl score higher, score. though? In a, in a while. It's, it's the lowest okay. I've given in a while. Um, I was going to say I excused some of the, like, overt auditory stuff and, um, like, weird pans from characters back and forth really quickly because I thought that was what they were trying to shape with the schizophrenia. But now that I think about it just as my own enjoyment, I did not like that. So, yeah. I think the most annoying scene was when he was in the um, the restricted area when he was trying to solve something, and it was the the very um, stereotypical genius figuring out the code. Oh. <laughs> and yeah. it was the camera was um, going around him, and he's seeing the different patterns. I'm like, I don't think that's how it works, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I was very confused because I I I, I I'm, I'm sure. Some people are, you know, visually gifted like that, but I don't know how that makes for a good film. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know how he was able to concentrate on those numbers when a camera was going around him. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. Sure, like, yeah, he's a very talented man, but uh, come on. Come on, Ron Howard. I mean, do people actually think like that? I don't know. I'm at the very bottom tier of the intelligence. <laughs> I, I think some people do in that they're able to recognize patterns more yeah, easily. Yeah, it's a pareidolia others, or something. But it's not. I don't. I don't think it's as much in the way. It has to do yeah. much in the way of like intelligence. I think it's just the ability to recognize patterns. patterns yeah. Right. Uh, can we talk about? I think what I'm most most interested in, which speaks a little bit about myself, is his time as a graduate student, uh, to me. <laughs> Which was like third, so, like 20 minutes of yeah. the film. <laughs> so to me, I think it didn't get enough time in the film in that his most significant accomplishment, <laughs> apart from, you know, solving Hilbert's 19th problem or what have you, <laughs> his most significant accomplishment is the Nash equilibrium and the development of game theory as we know it. Um, and yet that doesn't get nearly as much time as I think it should have. And that speaks like to minute. Sheldon's point, right? Um, and, and the way I remember this film for the most part is his time as a graduate student. That makes sense because throughout the film during that segment of his life, it's trying to establish the basis by which Nash kind of gets to his um, gets to his equilibrium, right? Um, I think there are a few points where he's playing Go. He realizes that not all games are, you know, perfectly organized. Uh, when he's at the bar many times, which I think is a very accurate representation of graduate school life, is how much time he spends at the bar. Um, not necessarily hitting on chicks, but <laughs> at the bar. Christian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Christian um, speaking from experience. Yeah. Um, 
his experiences at the bar um, in formulating uh, competition versus cooperative games. Um, and I think there was a few other things, but I think the film does a good job of establishing that aspect in, in terms of how he gets to the equilibrium. And it's not this, you know, moment of genius that he comes up with it. It's like a series of experiences that he goes through to get there. And then the rest of the film kind of falls flat. Um, but I want I want to talk about the graduate student experience. Um, Shocking <laughs> that you would like to talk about that. I wonder. If... Yeah. I did. But, I did feel um, the same way. Um, that oh, sorry, Team did you have to... No, I didn't have anything else to say. Just more quips. So go, Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, it did feel like um, I, I understand that they use that to set up um Charles and sort of ease us into um his uh, schizophrenia. Um, so it's not all at once, and we don't uh. uh so that we have the mystery unfold as well. But yeah, it, it did, that first 20 some minutes felt so rushed. Um, there was an, there were like ups and downs constantly. Um, there, there was no room to breathe, no room to understand what was happening, uh, his thought process in college, his experience with his friends. Um, like first we see them, uh, we see them uh, apprehensive and kind of mocking him. And all of a sudden they're at the bar together. We mm -hmm. don't see, there's no intermediate step. We don't see any sort of um, real development. We're just told that this is, this happened, this happened, this mm -hmm. happened. Oh, he graduated, he's off to the labs. Um, yeah, so that, that first 30 minutes, the, the first impression that the movie leaves on you, left on me, um, was just, um, it felt rushed and um, yeah, it lacked focus. Yeah, when, when he was picking the other two graduate students that he could take to the Wheeler Labs, I was like, oh, why'd he pick those guys? Like, as and he was so sure. And as a viewer, I was like, why is he so sure? We barely got to see them. Mm -hmm. And then when they were talking in the future, like his other colleague, I forgot his name. Um, Hanson? It, like, the one he was sharing the <laughs> scholarship with. Mm -hmm. He he spoke to um, Nash as if they were like really good friends, but I was like, you only spent like two t two or three times at the um, at the bar together. I was like, how did you become that close that you would you're willing to maybe almost sacrifice your position in um, in Princeton for letting someone who who you know is like not super stable. Um, and you've seen him actually and you, you were proven right that he's not. He's not all there yet, but he continued to help them. I was like, they must have gone through something in those 20 minutes that we didn't see that should have been more established. So this, the last, the, the scenes further in the end would have made more sense. Do you think this is a practice in, I don't know, I, maybe all film bi biopics are, do you think this is practice in like selection bias in that you only mem remember certain memories, the ones that, you know, where Hanson is picking on you um, and not, you know, well, he doesn't spend time in class, but you know, all the other, you know, days of the year where, you know, maybe something doesn't, something event, not uneventful happen, if that makes sense, yeah. Um, Maybe, but it still would have reinforced his character either way. I don't think it would have lost anything to his characterization as a oh, nerd um, <laughs> to like have those friendly moments. And it would have made more sense to have even a mo even one scene where he and Hanson had it or like shake shake hands or like he explains go to him. Like there are so many things that could have been mm -hmm. that would have made later connections to the university um, more stable. Because I know in his actual life. He had such a strong connection to Princeton. That's why he wanted to go back, right? After he was diagnosed and went to the hospital, that's why he specifically chose that community. He didn't have a church community. He didn't have other friends. Like, school was everything. But we don't feel that emotional connection in these scenes. So when he goes back, it's kind of like, oh, it's funny, John Nash. But it should be more like he's going back to family. So that's another thing that, like, tonally feels a bit off. Um, at first, though, when I um my interpretation for like why they didn't have those friendly scenes was because of his paranoia because he did start having schizophrenia or he started seeing the effects of schizophrenia when he got to his highest stress point in graduate school 
Yeah. But I don't, looking at this as a viewer, I don't think that's well explained. If I didn't Google it or like already know about him, I would have missed that. I guess like the big thing that maybe if they wanted to go with that um, is to make the whole movie through his point of view. But we, we were like switching a lot. Um, there wasn't really a clear, I guess there's a clear difference between when we're seeing it through his eyes and when we're not. But th that was never really established. So sometimes even during grad school, it was like a kind of like a, you're seeing it as a third person instead of Nash. So if it was Nash the whole time, or at least um, shown that it was Nash, uh, Nash's point of view, then it would have made like sense. Um, but I, I don't know. I think it was just lazy. <laughs> Lazy? Lazy. <laughs> I mean, most most geniuses are <laughs> quite lazy. I mean, the screenwriting. Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Not, I don't know, I don't know if Nash was lazy or anything. His own personal laziness. It was like, <laughs> be at the bar, guys. Let's never have a real conversation. Let's just drink and like talk about babes. Mm hmm Maybe that's how grad students became friends back in the day. Honestly, when I was a pre, when I was a teenager, back in the day, and like it's before, and still, still how it happens. <laughs> I went babes. to grad school. Well, babes, it wasn't like that for me. <laughs> most of my notes this week were on the representation of graduate students and academic life. <laughs> but oh my god! I mean, there are oh my god. most of my notes like alcoholism. Good representation of the lifestyle. Uh, publish or perish, that mentality, where he's talking about your, where his advise, uh, advisor is telling him that, Nash, your, your classmates have, are, have all gone to classes and they've published already, um, which, which, you know, definitely true in the 50s when he, or 40s while he's operating, uh, certainly true now. Um, uh, Grad students wearing sweats, very accurate. Um, I feel like uh, that's true for all college students. Uh, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> um, the thing I did not like, uh, which might be based in fact, might not be, is the way they portray Nash as very socially awkward. Um, and so in his mind that he, lacks that interpersonal connection with anybody else kind of rubs me the wrong way um i don't know how you guys feel about that did he actually i don't know lack interpersonal relations i don't know there's or no abilities. evidence for it there's no evidence for like that characterization in his own life he didn't just like the way they represented him in the movie, but he had relations with lots of other people. He had friends. Mm -hmm. He was part of a church growing community when he was young. So he's used to socializing with others. Um, he's not afraid to make his own choices. So like that could be alienating, but there's no evidence for him being like, um, like not making gays with people. They gave him a lot of additional, mm -hmm. like, like what I like to call bonus features for people with mental illnesses. Um, and oh, then, uh, for some reason, I thought he was on the spectrum, at least the way he, he was portrayed during uh, like when he was in uh, his grad, uh, grad career, grad school career. But it might have just been the movie. Like, it doesn't mean if you you have um, uh, some kind of other mental illness that you're in the spectrum. It's, those are like completely unrelated things. I mean, they could be. Um, related, but in this situation, it's not necessarily tied together. But the way the movie portrayed yeah. it, as if like one begets the other, yeah. which is kind of problematic. Yeah. Yeah, like other things about his character, like obsessiveness or um, compulsion, inability to walk away from problems. Those are things that Nash like often said, and like other people noted, he would become obsessed with things. It's like those were totally okay things to dig into, right? But things about um, his ability to face others, a quiet voice, like not not facing others or like hiding. I don't know why there was so much emphasis on that. People, it, regular people just hate 
intelli- intelligent people. <laughs> There's like, an anti intellectual. He, he, <laughs> he can't be normal. He can't act like in a normal social way if he's yeah. like super. He's super intelligent and. I think there's like a, what do you call it, a zero sum kind of thing that's going on where if you're you know so gifted in this one area, net, you have negative. to be socially, you know, it has to all balance acts. out. Yeah, it's, right. That's the Nash equilibrium: negative well. social, very positive in um, the intellectual spectrum, and then cancels out to zero. Oh, you know what? I didn't. I, did they actually meet as like student professor kind of student didn't, professor relationship? I didn't know. I don't know, but I thought, Wikipedia just says she graduated from yeah. MIT. My wow. initial reaction was, oh, that's so sweet. And then this reaction now. No, my initial reaction when I <laughs> okay, watched it. Okay, okay. Like, I was like, then, oh. Now I'm like, that's kind of that's kind of predatory. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is sus. Yeah, it felt um I, I I did not enjoy that, the whole courtship. Um, I did not either. progression. Um, it felt unethical. Mm-hmm. I felt <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, As someone who just graduated from college, I did not like. <laughs> they, but those, then it might be the truth, right? Like, um, yeah. if they just didn't give any sort of reason for the attraction, like I, I, did, I felt like there was like she walks into his office. Um, oh no no! It begins when she tells off the construction workers. Yeah, yeah. But... Hey. <laughs> no, but she was the one who made the first move, right? So I'm trying to see when she, like, she saw something. But I think it's just like it's his name, his position, his intelligence. I don't think his name yet, because uh, when they first meet, no, not yet. Not, he was not a big. Is his. The theorem is not being widely applied and okay. across academia. Then it's just his, I guess she likes uncaring professors, which I would have hated. I'm paying thousands, tens of thousands of dollars and my professors don't even bother to show up in class. No, thank you. That's true. Back then it was probably like, Less than a thousand dollars for the entire yeah, yeah. yeah. school. Yeah, that's true. For now, I would be like, oh my gosh. I also, would probably go with people who are going to MIT, you know, they have money to okay. money to money to give away. Yeah. I think something worth noting that the like the power dynamic totally messed up. But also, they were only four years apart in age. So I wonder if he was just like, yeah, whatever. Because before this, Nash had. Like while he was at MIT, he just fathered a son with a nurse that he randomly yeah. met at the hospital. Oh, like, yeah. like clearly this guy is just whatever. <laughs> I mean, so I mean, they're only four years apart, but when in my first year of grad school, I was TAing people who are, you know, only a year younger than me. And I would not have, you know, dared cross that cross Christian. that TA undergrad <laughs> boundary. That's just that's just wrong. <laughs> I think I, I don't think. I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, the, the age difference, I don't think matters. I think, yeah, it's definitely the, po- <laughs> it's the positional situation. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's similar to like coworker, boss, and, yeah. um, you know, non-boss. <laughs> non-boss, employee. Non-boss. Employee, yeah. boss and employee. <laughs> yeah, there was def- definitely some, yeah, it, it just felt, um, uncomfortable how easily the p- film played it off mm-hmm. like i was just uncomfortable she's just hey. gets us weirdos hey. from cmu because yeah. <laughs> to be honest this kind of like matches how people are yeah. <laughs> also because people do date like like freshmen um it, it happens every year there there's like at least one couple every year that gets engaged like a senior and a freshman so and like professors who uh, are at on the campus right now who married their students oh, um, oh my and are like very vocal about it on yeah. campus that's definitely a thing that happens i think it's maybe a white thing that happens in academia <laughs> there's, there's something going i think there's something going on there <laughs> there's something odd is it like it might be a i don't know it's a weird dynamic 
Um, but I could see it happening. I just don't like it. <laughs> it's like um, usually women are made to think that men older and men of higher power are those who like seek and men usually society societal yeah. perspectives but men usually seek women that are like beneath them while women seek men that are the same level or higher so i think that speaks to these weird um relationships yeah. which... i think yeah, if it if it actually happened um in real life if he was the teacher and she was the student and um that's how it played out um, then fine. But it's just the way the film yeah. just so quickly glosses over mm -hmm. it and, and uh, assumes that the audience will accept it that quickly um, where their, yeah, their attraction is shown in maybe 30 seconds um, and we're supposed to buy it from there. There's no other convincing. Yeah, the, the, screen, the filmmakers felt that they uh, had no other reason to convince us. There was no, nothing yet. No other evidence you need to show. Are you saying that Nash's finding connect ability to connect the stars wasn't convincing for you? <laughs> like, look, an umbrella. <laughs> pick, pick an object, any object, Ricochet. and I will connect. Wait, and their first date was like the governor's ball. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> what? That was pretty wild. That is wild. Imagine meeting someone for the first time. I'm like, oh, okay, cute. And then takes them to a pretty big um, and public public event. Like yeah. Governor's Ball now would have like a lot of media attention to it. And you would actually get pictures published to the attention. internet. I guess more widespread um, media attention. And then you'll be, this is going to be like, you're, pro you're essentially proclaiming your love by sending and when you're um taking someone to that that public mm -hmm. of an event yeah. it's like it was the 1840s or something <laughs> yeah uh, the governor's ball i don't know if you guys also noticed um at that ball uh while they were outside pointing at the stars like idiots um there is a knockoff version of moonlight serenade playing and it was very off-putting because i was expecting like I was expecting Moonlight Serenade, but the chords were just all wrong. I didn't hear. <laughs> I wasn't listening. What's Moonlight that Serenade? Da -da 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 no, I'm thinking of another song. It's, I'm going too fast, but it's a it's a slow kind of um, okay slow tune. Glenn Miller. Um, okay, and it just okay. felt it was so wrong. <laughs> I see. I felt violated. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That scene was already bad. If you if you if you were listening to, it. Yeah. did they actually do that? Did they actually fall in love in love that quick, or it was just like poor, poor development? Who knows? <laughs> I can picture people getting in love that quickly. I mean, one explanation for the high divorce rate in the U.S., oh. but also like, <laughs> I think that's just like a I don't. I think I've heard that it's a Southern thing, but I'm, I'm open to it being like a national thing where you find, you know, college people or college, not college people, you know, the college, people. <laughs> um, like your college person in your, in, uh, in college. I can't speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> your college person call it, in the college. We, they call it getting the MRS, right? Your MRS. <laughs> MRS degree. Yeah, your MRS. Degree. What does that stand for? Mrs. Mrs. Oh, like um, yeah. And and if it has like a colloquialism, obviously it's got to be you know widespread enough. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you know fast track to uh, paradise. Another thing. I would agree. That's like a total U.S. thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's uh, my parents when they went to school in the Northeast. It was a thing there. School. Everybody was just partnering up. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, they they went to UPenn, so oh. maybe it's an Ivy League. Um, Ivy League know. love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, love. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Air quotes. No one, no one can see us doing this. Air quotes. <laughs> yeah. The under 10% acceptance rate. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> MIT is not an Ivy League. <laughs> oh, it's not. It's not just those schools. Um, I think it's every. every it's yeah. just like a college thing. Yeah, American sure. college thing. So I don't know if I want to attribute it to the time period, but I feel like based on this one data point um, that I oh, want perfect. to attribute it to uh, uh, sort of, so in 2001, when this film is being re uh, released, but also I guess in 2000, while it's being produced, um, there's sort of, there's the United States' existential crisis, right? Which comes out after the Cold War, um, where the US doesn't quite know who it is, because up to that point, it's always had some external enemy that it was combating. But since 1990, it's been the one and only superpower in the world and it doesn't have anyone to fight. And so it cannot define itself externally. Um, and so this film sort of, to me, represents going back to a time, 1947 to 94, when the US had its greatest you know, arch nemesis in the Soviet Union. And it sort of portrays that conflict, right? Uh, based on this one data point, A Beautiful Mind 2001, um, I want to <laughs> attribute enough it. Enough data. Yeah, I want to <laughs> attribute it to that. I think, I think there's something there. Uh, and also, like in 2001, you get, you know, uh, the U.S. kind of redefines itself. Right with two thousand with uh, the September eleventh attacks, um, in that it no longer becomes the enemy of communism; it becomes the hero against terrorism writ large. So that's that's happening before the films going through production and everything. Um, I don't know if you have ideas or thoughts against or for or not either of it, uh, that was one thought I had. Normally, I think I would be more accepting of the current historical period in which the film is being made influencing the direction of the film. But mm -hmm. in the discussion that we've had, um, I feel at least somewhat strongly that because there were so many elements of Nash's life that they're trying to capture that Comparisons to the modern day were more likely to be missed than included if there was potential um, allegory or um, comparison to the situation at the time. Um, I would hesitate to say it was intentional and instead say it's probably an accident because they oh. had a hard enough time including stuff from Nash. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't mean to say it was intentional, as in like oh, the okay. studio wanted to portray this. I, th I, I think it was more like a, a byproduct. Projection? Okay. A byproduct mm. of that sort of feeling since the 90s. That's That was my argument. Yeah. This was produced I was by DreamWorks. <laughs> Wait, was it? Wait, yes. what? <laughs> DreamWorks and um, Universal. I, I think one of my notes was like... Um, it's from DreamWorks. It better be Shrek here, but it wasn't. So that it was a little um, saddening. The biggest it was, disappointment. It was a pretty big disappointment. <laughs> Maybe that's the that's the story they hadn't <laughs> figured out themselves. The same way that the U.S. was rediscovering its meaning in the world, and then the Universal or not Universal DreamWorks, where DreamWorks. they made Shrek and they figured it out. They're like, this is our purpose in life. When did Shrek come out? I'm like 2001. 2001, right? Okay. <laughs> April 22, 2001. When did Beautiful Mind come out? Not December, December oh. or something. Yeah. I think they just put a lot of resources and efforts and effort into Shrek that it kind of put this movie aside. Uh, very long But they still won awards, apparently. Uh, so. Did Shrek win? Shrek was the inaugural um, best animated picture what? winner, right? Yeah. Really? I thought, so. I think so, wasn't it? Wasn't that Toy Story? I don't know whether to be proud or, or was it Toy but... Story? I, <laughs> I hope know. it's Toy Story. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to take a look. 
I don't know. Even though Shrek. I'm not a fan of Toy Story, I hope it was Toy Story. Oh, it was Toy right. Story. Shrek won. Shrek, Shrek won the first ever right. yeah. Academy Award for Best Animated Feature. Oh, do you know Shrek competed for the Palm d'Or in Cannes? Really? Yeah. Oh, Shrek won the first ever Academy Award for Best Animated Feature and was also nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. Oh. And it earned that. six awards, award nominations uh, from the Baf- from BAFTA, and oh, wa- won. And it won a uh, best adapted screenplay. It was a good year for DreamWorks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I like. I think the. I like the film in that it kind of contradicts Adam Smith. There's a line where it says, Oh, yeah. okay, that one. <laughs> he says, <laughs> there's a line. Adam Smith said the best results come from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself, right? Incomplete, because the best result will come from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself and the group. Uh, the thesis of Adam Smith was wrong, I think is kind of... I, th- I think for a best picture winner to argue that Adam Smith was wrong, at least in one aspect, is kind of important because there's still sort of like a reverence for the Enlightenment figures in that, oh, they're the Enlightenment figures. How could they ever be wrong? Um, and this film sort of taking a deep dive, or not deep dive, Definitely not a deep dive, deep. <laughs> but um, introducing to the broader public the idea that, you know, academia is well past Adam Smith and that we should think past him, past past the 1770s um, is, I think, quite monumental and, and, and a good thing. Um, uh, that, that said, that's coming from someone who thought <laughs> most important part of the film was like the first the universe, 20, first minutes. 20 minutes <laughs> so um uh take that as you will do you think for the i guess the average viewer do you think someone would have put uh, picked that up i i think i picked that up when i first watched it and no i guess but i when was did an you watch average it? viewer uh, when did you watch it like seventh grade you are not an average seventh grader. You're <laughs> <laughs> saying that you are abnormal. Oh, you're an abnormal seventh grader. <laughs> I also want to bring um, the uh, idea of John Nash's institutional um, being institutionalized. Um, in that, I don't think of these two films when I think of these two films. I don't connect these two films. But um, watching this, um, I was like, oh, yeah, this is taking a place around the same time. And that's this film, A Beautiful Mind, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, right? Um, And this film does a more tame or portrays uh, mental illness treatment more tamely (laughs) than that, which is odd because it comes after that um and so it's not like it's you know blind to the abuses of mental illness patients back in the 50s and 60s Um, it's definitely strange how this film you know it shows that you know they try to help him in that uh in that in that with that method that um, the insulin shock therapy that Mm -hmm. you know now nobody uses anymore because because it's more harm than good um but instead of you know, uh, the, I think the message it imparts is not good for people who might not know that much about mental illness. Like instead of you know, instead of him Nash going to seek treatment after this, it's mm. nope, I don't need treatment. I just need love from mm. my wife. That's all I need to get better. Yeah, all I need is the people around me. Like sure, like I think it, it is important to have people support you, but. Don't tell that to the Christian scientists. Yes, yes. Um, I think they're the average viewer either. <laughs> yeah, if anything, this was the only part of the movie that Nash had conflicts with too, because he, the only thing he said was factually really inaccurate was that they had him, they had him say, say a line after 
he went to the hospital that was oh yeah i'm on the newer meds when he sees not harvey what's his oh. name hansen or hansen no when he sees yeah when he sees uh-huh. hansen in oh, the place, yeah. he's like yeah uh-huh. i'm taking that newer stuff and he was like no that line i didn't i would never say that because after i went to the hospital i was like treat me and then after i left i said never give me medicine again like he was even more against medicine than um they portray him to be and at the time he would have been seen as more of a heretic and like against the cases of other schizophrenia patients but nowadays it's much easier to go back and look at him and be like he was probably right or like not right but he was in in the ethical right because Mm -hmm. he was concerned about the side effects of those medicines and the treatments that he got so like now that we have advanced a lot further with um representing mental illness i'd say like this movie is not a good representation Mm -hmm. But back then, this was revelatory. Um, eh, whether or not that means it's still good to watch and appreciate. And like, uh, uh, but yeah. There is the, when, a uh, very uh, fun note for me was when uh, they're chasing him, uh, the, the, the group of uh, thug looking psychiatrists are chasing him through the campus. <laughs> and they finally catch up to him. And all of a sudden, Christopher Plummer shows up. And he says, my name is Rosen, Dr. Rosen. Like, who says that? My name <laughs> is Dr. his first name? <laughs> he says, my name is Rosen, Benjamin Rosen. I'm a psychiatrist. <laughs> my name is Rosen, Dr. That just. That's like, why he didn't believe him, right? Because like, who, yeah. who, who who's a doctor? Well, <laughs> that seemed a little lazy. Well, I think. Was it for traumatic effect? I wouldn't put it past. I, would, I, I wouldn't put past t- mid-century. Um, My name is Wilson. Doctors to sort of, you know, emphasize their last their name. Advanced yeah. degree. No, I, no, the advanced degree. Um, I thought they would just say Doctor Rosen. I'm Doctor Rosen. Hey, yo, no, I'm well, Doctor Rosen. Well, John's <laughs> comment was was that directed towards his, oh, okay. his doctor instead of his first name, right? So. I wouldn't put it past, you know, mid-century academics or, you know, eggheads to sort of emphasize egg that, heads. you know. Yeah. It could Rosen. even be that, like, the part of realism there is that at the time, psychiatry may not have been accepted as much, so he needs to emphasize that he actually has mm, skills or actually sure. value. But still, it's definitely played up in that moment, and it's not a realistic way for a patient to be meeting their doctor. And so the yeah. fact that that was his, the name of his real doctor and someone he had a long-term relationship with and immediately puts them at an antagonistic, antagonistic, I can't words, um, like interaction made me really upset. Like if they were, if the filmmakers were so worried about this seeming like a bad representation of people about schizophrenia, which like, it seems like there's some evidence for that then they shouldn't have had them fight right away. They should have just been like, go to the doctor, my dude, or like had his friends and family take him to the doctor, not kidnap him. But dramatic effect, you know. Was that was that actually a thing where he was, he, he had a lecture and um, was it, yeah, so he was, uh, he had a lecture and he started seeing thug, um, well, I think it was, um, he was lecturing at Columbia and Columbia? they, he was started like rambling nonsense, uh-huh. right? I don't know mm-hmm. if he was absconded with from there, but um, I think that lecture aspect was, you know, derived from some truth. <laughs> yeah, reportedly yeah, people changed. in the audience immediately knew something was wrong. And yeah. like after that okay. connected him to like the available resources, but there was, I'm pretty was sure no from that incident, they didn't like kidnap him. Yeah, they didn't like tackle him to the ground and like, no, nah, yeah, you're just, under like, arrest to the psycho hospital. Just stabbed him with a tranquilizer. Just, yeah, just that, that is actually probably more realistic though, because every time he was taken to the hospital, he needed to be restrained. By Dr. Rosen. Dr. Rosen. Every got punched in the face. <laughs> oh yeah oh i had a slap counter there was a lot of slaps in the first half of the movie um like when lot. he was slapped by the lady in in the bar was he slapped and then mm-hmm. um alicia slapped someone and then someone slapped at least there, there were at least four or five slaps or something yeah. but only in the first half 
<laughs> Which, maybe she, like, she like knocks the wind out of Anthony Rapp. Yeah. They're very satisfying slap sounds. Lots of slaps. One uh, issue I had with Jennifer Connelly um, was how her hair was just uh, luscious and wavy. She was no matter what. She was too perfect. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it was just so unrealistic. She was like, "Oh my gosh!" She she's like a she she was basically working for both of them. She was taking care of all three of them. She was doing all the housework, um, yeah. taking care of their ch- child. And she looked perfect. I was like, I was like wow. how? But yeah, maybe that's why she was hired. I don't it's know. It's her uh, physics degree. She uh, put it to good use. She mastered it. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, if I turned my head in a certain degree and moved mm-hmm. in a certain velocity with such and such acceleration, my hair will not <laughs> cover my face. That makes sense. Brilliant. Did anyone notice? Beyond her time. Yeah. Did anyone notice at the end when other professors are coming down to lay their pens in front of Nash that one of the professors is David Wallace from The Office? Who's David Wallace? Who's David Wallace? Oh, the, the uh, executive? Yeah, the Dunder Mifflin. Oh, really? <laughs> I, didn't, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> just had a cameo in this before he got big role. His big role. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like they had an emphasis on everybody's faces in that scene too. You know what I mean? I was like, is there, mm. so, is there a cameo here that I'm supposed <laughs> to know about that I'm not getting? Well, clearly there was one and I didn't Apparently, notice. yeah. <laughs> well, not a cameo because he wasn't famous yet, right? Yes. Just an extra, yeah. Yeah, just an extra. Small beginnings. All right. I think that's it for the discussion. Unless you guys want to talk about something else. Oh, the only note uh, I noticed, Mm -hmm. which kind of bothered me for some reason. I didn't like the LA downtown filter at the beginning of the movie. There was like some sort of filter at the beginning of the movie that made it seem like it- Yeah, it was like- Like uh, orange- Autumnal, it was autumnal, right? I don't know. It felt like fall. They used it it for LA. And I was just like, why? (laughs) There was something I did not like about that intro. In that they're at their orientation, right? And the professor is explaining to the mathematics graduate students why mathematics is important as though they did not know (laughs) mathematics is important. (laughs) I was was incredibly confused. Rubbing their egos or whatever. Maybe, (laughs) maybe, (laughs) but come on. You did not make a but, mistake but you're <laughs> choosing right. that, this program. That filter. That filter. The is, uh, filter was off putting. I don't know. I don't know if it continued throughout the film. It might have just been like a time distinction of here is when he was younger and this is the color of the skies back in the 1950s. <laughs> and now this is the present day, which is the, the 60s, 70s. All right. Let's take some scores. Sheldon. Uh, 4.5. Oh. Oof. Wow. Uh, Yingli. Uh, I'll give it a six and a half. Zara. I wrote it down before everyone. 6.5. Can make it. Oh, dang. Oh, it's backwards. <laughs> I gave it a 7.5, which is. Wow. It's the, gra- it's the 20 minutes that carried it for you, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me see. If the movie stopped there, it would have been a higher score. <laughs> I gave points for Ooh. realism. <laughs> um, so I guess, yeah, the grad school stuff, <laughs> the academic <laughs> life stuff. That, that was the only realistic part, because after that, um, like, the relationship was kind of not really very realistic. Yeah, most Unless my, it was real. I don't know. <laughs> most of my scores were, like, 70%. All right, and that gives an average of 6.25. Nice, clean. Quarters. Six six and a quarter. Glad I was able to drag it down a bit. (laughs) (laughs) A bit. Christian was pulling it upwards. Yeah. Yeah, you two were uh, in a battle for Mm -hmm. uh, a six. I was the thesis, and Sheldon was the antithesis. (laughs) 
<laughs> and we reached the a synthesis. All right. Next okay. week's film is Room, 2015. With Brie Larson, right? With uh, yes. Yeah. Not Tommy Wiseau. Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> <laughs> Not Tommy Wiseau. All right. Oh, is there something else I was supposed to do? I can't remember. I think you're supposed yeah. to have an outro. Well, okay. So in the last four weeks, okay, I think I've 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 made this a little easier to do. So in the last four weeks, the best film has still been Princess Mononoke, uh, which has been the best film for the past three weeks. And the worst film is not A Beautiful Mind, but what is Children that? of the Corn. <laughs> So, <laughs> I, I keep forgetting we watched that movie. I think so. it's just my mind suppressing the fact that I did watch that movie. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'm about to do my outro now. Um, Jesus Christ. Um, okay. Superstar. It's gonna sing. It's gonna uh, sing this, isn't it? No. <laughs> uh, that just about wraps up this meeting of the Anarcho Syndicalist Film Club. There's a lot more to discuss, so offer your comments using the hashtag ASFC. What? We have a hashtag! <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> ASFC. Uh, on Twitter, Facebook, or your favorite social media platform. Be sure to join us next week as we discuss Room 2015. Catch you on the flip side. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Catch you on the flip side. Should have sang instead. <laughs> <laughs>